Hello there, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Emperor Voices, and this is one of the regular webinars we do where we discuss about big issues, except that it's not one of the regular webinars we do. It's slightly different. We're actually going to look at a book. It's this book. You can probably see it. I hope you can see it the right way around, but it's called Marx and the Climate Crisis, and it's written by Elaine Graham Lee, who you can see here. And Elaine is a local author. She lives locally in, in, in London Borough of Enfield. She's an activist, but she is a strong believer, I think, that Marx has a lot to say about the dynamics of society and how, change, how, how changes happen, and how progress happens. And um, although we might think climate change and Marx, they just don't go together. I think Elaine's going to explain to us a bit why she thinks that the dynamics that Marx talks about is very relevant to how we see climate change today. So, Elaine, I hope I've got that right, and you'll tell me if I haven't. But let's start, first of all, then, and welcome, for, you know, for being here, and thanks for doing it. But tell us first a bit, just a little bit about yourself and your background. Um, yeah, sure. Well, um, as, you, as you say, um, I, I'm a local. In fact, I, I grew up in, uh, in East Barnet. So I often say I'm like a medieval peasant. So I've never been, you know, never lived more than five miles from my birthplace, which is almost true. Um, so uh, I got involved in sort of climate, um, uh, sort of climate activism uh, more than 20 years ago now. Um, in sort of in, in the late 90s. Um, I was in the Green Party for a while and uh, um, then I was involved in uh, in respect for a little bit and uh, various sort of uh, um, United Front campaigns like the so campaign against climate um, against climate change and things like that, um, and always really looking for you know, the most number of people to to work with to sort of build the movement against climate change. Um, and but I do think that theory is important. I think you can't have the movement on the street without the theory, and and vice versa. Really, if you if you're writing theory but you're not getting out there and doing anything, that also doesn't work. So. I think that's kind of what sort of shaped my politics over the last uh, uh, more years than I care to count, really. Um, I was also, I, I stood for the Green Party in Enfield Southgate in 2001, so people might remember me from then, a long time ago. So it sounds like you're a follower of Paul O'Frere, too, the combination of theory and action, the praxis. Um, but, then, but anyhow, I mean, you, you obviously talk about theory, and is that what made you want to write and write a book on Marx and climate change? Um, yes, I mean, I think I found because I, I do quite a lot of things sort of book reviewing and that sort of thing. And I found that I was keeping on saying the same things were wrong with the books that I was reviewing. So I thought that it was about time that uh, um, I just, you know, put myself out there and said, and said what I thought needed to be said about Marx and climate change rather than just criticising everybody else. Um, so in a way, it, uh, I think I, I suckered myself into it uh, by telling myself that, oh, it'll just be easy. I'll just pull together various articles I've written. It'll only take me a few weeks. And then several months later, this is, <laughs> this is the result. Yeah, well, but that, that's how it, uh, how it goes. Um, it's quite interesting, really, because, I mean, I, I, I saw a comment on one of the sites we got from someone who saw you were doing this, and they said, Marx and climate change? Wow. Um, you know, I mean, you know, some people would say and argue, and maybe justifiably, that Marx was a mid-19th century philosopher of the mid-industrial age, uh, a child of the Enlightenment, in a way. Um, and it's, he's less relevant to the industrial age, the post-industrial age, rather. Is that something that you were trying to put right? Very much so. I mean, there's this image of Marx um, as if, you know, as if to be a Marxist, you're kind of automatically associated with smokestacks, um, which I think is, which, which is very unfair. And I think it, it doesn't understand the extent to which Marx was really concerned about the environment and thought a lot about the natural world and capitalism's effect on the natural world. It's actually, um, he, unfortunately, he died before he was able to pull that together into a work. I think if he'd lived for five more years, we would have a very different conception of him because he definitely had a lot of thoughts about that that he wanted to pull together and wasn't able to. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think I think in a way it suffers from sort of people thinking of, sort of Stalinist five-year plans and things like that, and that's that's used as a as a way of dismissing Marx as an environmentalist. But really, he was. Well, I mean, one of the themes of your book right early on anyhow, is that your belief that capitalism, or Marx's belief as well, that capitalism alienated humankind from nature. So rather than living with it, they tried to control it. 
Um, are you saying that that's what Marx foresaw and that's what you see in Marx? Um, well, it's part, it's part of, uh, of what makes Marx a really important environmentalist, yes, because uh, Marx's uh, um, his argument, as, as you say, is that humans are alienated from nature. So it's not just that, it's partly that industrial society physically removes people from nature. So the sort of you know, um, bringing people together into, in cities to, to feed uh, um, you know, industrial factories, work in industrialized factories and so on, as opposed to living in the countryside is kind of, you know, it's a physical expression of alienation. But it's also an attitude as well, that, uh, that you're alienated from what you work on. And so and part, um, and the natural world is part of what you work on. So capitalist work alienates you from the natural world. Um, so it's a, um, it, it's a psychological process as well as a kind of a practical one in that sense. But it has very, um, very deep consequences throughout, throughout capitalist society. Um, I talk about in the book some of the proposals to um, sort of in a sense separate human society completely from the natural world. Some of these sort of proposals about sort of half earthing and sort of setting aside you know, half the planet for nature and then the other half for us. And that's, re that's the kind of the ultimate expression of an alienated society, if you like. Um, and that's what Marx says, you know, this is, this is what cap one of the things that capitalism does to us. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, the half earth of sure. yeah, Wilson and so on. But, um, you, you know, you, you say that Marx saw capitalism as alienation. Um, but there are other people um, like John Gray, for example, in the London School of Economics and books like The Black Mass and his latest book, I can't remember the title, Marionettes is in it, I know. But he, he argues that control of nature began 10,000 years ago with the agricultural revolution. That's where it started. Um, so it may be less to do with capitalism than humans realizing they're no longer a part of nature, but somehow they're above it, they're different and they control it. It's not a Marxist thing. Well, I think um, Marx would say, and, and I would say, that um, you can control nature and you can work on nature, but that doesn't mean that you're not a part of it. I mean, he's right in the sense that um, I think we have a much better understanding now of the extent to which human societies have always shaped the natural world around them. Um, and actually that's something that, that actually doing research for the, for the book, um, I found really fascinating finding all the examples of societies that uh, you know, sort of Western colonialists dismissed as completely primitive and having no effect on their environment were actually sort of terraforming their environment over many thousands of years. So um, like some uh, indigenous peoples in the Amazon and uh, in Australia and, uh, and the plains of America and so on. These are all examples of non-industrial, but actually really kind of quite complex uh, management of ecosystems, if you like. But that doesn't, what, what, what Marx says that sets humans apart from everything from all the rest of the natural world, it isn't an issue of control, it's that we can plan. So other species um, can have obviously huge effects on, uh, on the ecosystems that they live in, but we're the only ones who can decide to do it and to build that in our minds and then implement it. And that's what sets us apart. But that doesn't mean we're not part of the natural world. I mean, Marx says we are, um, we, we are an integral part of nature. Okay, I mean, so you explained that well, but one of the other themes in your books, again early on, is it seems to me that you partly wrote the book, not only, but partly to challenge the view that uh, you can, you can you know, address climate change by small changes in your life, personal changes, lifestyle, you know, changing your diet, planting a tree here and there. Um, is that a fair assessment of what you were trying to do? Yes, I think that is a fair assessment. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm saying actively don't do changes in your own life, you know, because you can make a very small amount of difference by doing that. And, you know, if it makes you feel good about yourself to do those things, then fine, do that. But I think um, it is a major misconception in large parts of the movement that as individuals or as consumers, in a sense, the way that we get changes by making changes in our own lives, that is not how the system that we live in works. We're told that that's how the system that we live in works, but it is not true. So by changing how you eat, what you purchase, you know, those, those things, that those aren't how you get change on the scale that we need. The only way that you get change on the scale that we need is by actually seizing control of the system, which is why I'm a Marxist. Okay, so, I mean, you talk about that rather than having personal changes, you need systematic change. But I'm not clear from your book the actual nature of the systematic change you want. Well, ultimately, we need, I, I think, that we need to, we need to overthrow capitalism. We need to have a revolution. Um, 
But what I think I'm, I'm trying to argue in the book is that we really don't, we, we can't be in the position where we're saying that nothing can happen about climate change until the revolution, because, you know, it would be great if that could happen tomorrow, but it's clearly, it's a slightly longer time scale here. So what I'm arguing is that we, we do have, I think, we have a moment uh, because of the work that sort of Extinction Rebellion and the youth climate strikers have done to get climate change up the, uh, up, uh, up the, sort of the agenda and get more attention for climate change. We have a real opportunity here to get um, reforms right now, which would actually address the immediate problem of um, CO2 emissions. It won't prevent capitalism from go on, going on being environmentally destructive. It won't solve the next environmental crisis, but it will get us some way to at least ameliorating this one to give us time to work on that overthrowing the system bit, which is the essential bit. So it's a kind of a two-stage process, if you like. So you're not a purist. You don't say we don't do anything until we get the revolution. You accept that things can be done now, but still it leaves the problem there to be solved. Absolutely. And the point is that, you know, the sorts of changes that we'd be calling for, things like you know, some insulation programs, um, you know, improving rural public transport, those, those sorts of things, you know, those are things that would improve people's lives right now. I mean, it's no decent revolutionary stands aside from the struggle that affects people's lives in the, in the short term. This is what Rosa Luxemburg says. You, know, you don't just stand on the sidelines and say, oh, well, you're not being a pure revolutionary, so you know, we're just not going to engage with you. You have to engage with the struggles right now. Um, and that's, I think, what the climate movement is actually now in a very good position to do. Okay. I mean, that, I guess that was debate around historical <laughs> inevitability and that some people just didn't do anything until the revolution came, but others said you have to do something to, to make a difference. But it, 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 the other thing you said about in the first part of your book, your book you talk about how industrialization had taken people away from the land and they started treating land as a commodity. Um, rather than something they should belong to. And you cite examples of one person's name, I can't remember, who suggested we go back to the land uh, and reverse everything. You, you, you quoted E.L. Wilson, who wrote The Diversity of Life, and talked about half of the world being, you know, um, given over to nature and the other half we live in. But I don't get a clear picture again of what you think or what Mark's solution to this disconnect would be? I mean, you don't want us to go back to the land, do you? you don't want half earth. How do you want to connect again so it's real organic and not superficial? Well, this is an interesting one because I think Marx actually probably did rather want, pe want um, people to be able to go back to the, to, to the land um, in a sense that I think his, his vision of, of what um, a functioning society would have looked like did, it, did um, entail actually, you know, freeing people from the really appalling conditions in the slums in the big cities and going back to much more sort of village and sort of small towns and that sort of thing I think um, it's not like something that he spent a lot of time talking about because uh, he, he was often quite dismissive of, uh, sort of so imagining utopias um, because he thought that wasn't the, the priority um, I think now you obviously you don't want to be arguing for something that would that would uh, diminish people's living standards. And of course, when you think about issues around things like transport, it's a paradox that, um, in that modern Western society that for many people, if they as individuals move out of a city and move to their sort of small holding in Wales, whatever, that probably does actually mean that they would be personally responsible for quite a lot more um, CO2 emissions, certainly from having to drive their car around all the time than they would be if they stayed in the city. Uh, but as you will have, have, have got from what I said uh, earlier about half earthing and things, I really don't think that kind of separating human society from nature is at all the way to go. I think that is the, the culmination of the process of alienation, which is the whole, you know, the, the whole root of the problem. I think what we would probably be looking at is much more of a of a kind of a mosaic in a sense where you'd have you know, you don't have a density of population enough that people can work locally shop locally function locally to reduce the amount of transport that you have to have but you want that to be interspersed with you know space for trees nature food growing and so on um the closest i can come to it really is uh, in uh, uh, william morris's news from nowhere uh, where in the, in the book i talk about how he describes that the whole of england is a garden um and I think that probably is as close as I can get to maybe what this would look like, I think. Yeah, well, yes, I remember reading that book some time ago. Um, the book I haven't read, though, is The Principles of Population by Thomas Malthus. And you, <laughs> <laughs> you talk about him quite a lot as well. Yeah. I mean, he was concerned that population was pressing hard on the means of subsistence. But I think you argue that 
population isn't the problem. Now, can you tell us what you mean by that? And do you think the Mothus has come back a bit again into fashion in the 21st century? Yeah, well, Malthus keeps coming back into fashion. He's kind of the sort of the zombie person that just won't stay dead, really. Um, I mean, I think lo- lots of people have done um, lots of work sort of on, on his maths and pointing out the problem with his maths. So his basic argument was that uh, um, population ex- increases um, exponentially, whereas food production doesn't. So you're always going to outstrip your, your, um, your, your food productive capability. And, and that's just wrong, actually. He's just, he's just incorrect. Um, but the, re- the real problem is that uh, what Malthus was really doing was that he was making um, the processes of capitalism, whereas, whereas where capitalism needs to create a reserve army of labor, it needs to have a body of people who are basically unemployed, who can be called upon at will and then made unemployed again. Um, he makes that into nature. So when he talks about people who can't, who can't afford to eat because they're unemployed, he makes that as if that's nature saying there's no food for you, so be gone. Um, as he, he's, he's, he, well, he says that in the first volume of, uh, of the principles of population. He got quite a lot of flack for that, so he kind of toned it down a bit in the in the subsequent uh, editions. But that was that's his basic argument. Um, so again, I mean, he's not in a sense, therefore, he's not wrong, but it, he's ideological. He's made, he's saying this is how it should be because we because um, the uh, the bourgeoisie want to treat the proletariat in this way. This is therefore naturally ordained. Um, but isn't, think, isn't, isn't there a point that, you know, that the, that the pressure on resources now, on water, on food, on minerals, and they're all running out, or they're in a time of climate change going to be scarce in some places, doesn't that make him just a little more relevant than probably was when he wrote at the time? Well, you have to look at this at a, at a level of a society rather than about individuals. It's not about the number of people that we're supporting. It's about the resource use of the, of the system. So um, capitalist food production, for example, is incredibly wasteful. And it's incredibly wasteful by design. Uh, I mean, when you think about there's a, a, a famous example that um, John Bernie Foster gives of um, the number of um, productive processes in making a, sort of a supermarket muffin. And it was something like 19, I think, um, as opposed to sort of four, if you make it in a domestic kitchen. And the reason why the muffin that's produced uh, you know, in a factory has 19 productive processes is because each one of those adds a bit of surplus value. So that's, you know, that's profit for somebody. The more things you do to this benighted cake, um, the, the more profitable it is. So it's kind of that sort of wastefulness, uh, because of course all of those steps then produce emissions and they use resources and so on, um, is built into the structure of capitalism. So I think it's very clear that capitalism doesn't fit onto the planet properly. But you, what you can't do is argue from that that therefore the problem is the number of people on the planet. Um, I think there's... We obviously we have, we don't we haven't tried having um, seven billion people without capitalism on the planet. I think there's there's fairly good indications that actually under a different less wasteful system there would be easily enough to go around. Um, would there be enough to go around without growth? Because you argue, I think, that growth is a driving engine of capitalism, um, and you talk about moving towards a steady a steady state economy. Um, and I mean, what is a steady state economy and is it something you could sell to people who are used to commodities? Well, the idea of the steady state is that you can have capitalism, but you can, but you can pause it. So I'll, I'll, originally it's an idea from John Stuart Mill who thought that you would get to a point within capitalism where you just, you know, you just stop. Okay, you're making enough profit and you just go on making that level of profit and everything just stays the same forever and it's all fine. Um, and the problem is, I think, is that, the st- is that capitalism just doesn't work like that. Um, it needs to have constant growth because there is a tendency for the rate of profit to decline. So you can't ever stand still in capitalism. If you try, if you try to not grow, then actually you will make less profit. So, um, so I, don't, I don't think that the steady state is possible. And it's one of the reasons, actually, that you can't ultimately make compromises with the capitalist system if you're an environmentalist. Because... It, because under capitalism, it is true that it's continually expanding material production does create CO2 emissions and environmental damage in all sorts of ways. You can't just go on doing that. But you can't just say to the system, look, be nice and stop. So, so uh, no green growth then? Well, I don't think so. No. I mean, I know that there's, and I talk a bit in the book about that there's a, um, there have been studies of, uh, particularly in Scandinavia, which seem to indicate that some green growth was possible. But um, 
ultimately, I think the ideas of having sort of immaterial um, to growth in immaterial to services and so on, so that you decouple the emissions from the growth. I don't think that that's a goer in the long run. I think I'm with Herman Daly that you, you can't substitute for a lack of wood by having more carpenters. Okay, so the, the other thing you talk about is a human centric versus an eco centric view. And you talk a great deal about that. Um, and you felt that Marx took an ecocentric view in, in a way. But in, in a sense, people look on Marx as someone who, you know, had this view of a dialectic battle between labor and capital, which sounds terribly human centric to, to me and to other people. And nature doesn't figure in that. Well, I think the point that I was trying to make about, about Marx is that really you talking about whether you're ecocentric or, or human centric isn't the right way of looking at it because um, because human society is enmeshed in nature it's part of nature it doesn't really make any sense to say well which one are you putting first what he what he's doing is arguing actually for the interests of uh, um, of labor of ordinary people and the natural world as intertwined um, so I think you can't he doesn't take an explicit e ecocentric view in the sense that he's not saying that the uh, the ecosystem or the natural world is separate from and more important than humans. But he certainly isn't saying that, um, okay, humanity is all that matters and the natural world is just input. Um, and that doesn't matter either because he does have this conception of how much damage capitalism is doing to the natural world. So. But I mean, but I guess he does say, we mentioned this earlier, that, you know, under uh, a capitalist or an industrial system that, things are treated as commodities and not for what they intrinsically are. Um, yeah. And, you know, many would agree with that, not just Marxists, there are other people who clearly agree with that. Uh, but, the, but how do we move from a society where goods and services are commodities to one where they're not? That is like a huge cultural shift. It's not a dialectic shift. It's, it's a cultural shift about, you know, it, it, it changes 10,000 years of history. Well, I don't think it changes 10,000 years of history because um, uh, the natural world hasn't been a commodity for, for all of that long. I mean, yes, okay, 400 years of history, 500 years of history, maybe. Um, don't have to be quite as pessimistic as that. But yeah, I mean, no one said it was easy. Um, and I think that 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 is true, that when you, actually, when you think about what establishing a, um, a post-revolutionary society would be like, it would be... It, would be difficult it's not something that would happen in a week um but it would be for everyone's benefit if we were able to do it well it, it would only be to everyone's benefit if they knew what it was and you know one of the problems i think people have with marx is that although his analysis is very perceptive and brilliant at times and the process of how society changes is an important insight but you never quite know and i didn't see that in your book either what the end state is i mean we have no idea what the Marxist nirvana would look like. And if you're going to sell it, um, A, you need to know that. And if you don't know that, you often end up with tyranny, which is what's happened again and again. It's because it's not something you sell. It's something that people make for themselves. I mean, the, the, the ultimate basis of, of a, revolution, a, rev, a revolutionary society is, is democracy. It has, it has to be genuine radical democracy, not, you know, parliamentary democracy, but something that starts at the smallest possible unit and then works up. So it's not for, for Marx to say to people, right, this is what the ideal society would look like, because it's for all of us to come together and find a dem democratic way of deciding what the society we want to fight for should look like. So, you know, we're not, not in the business of giving prescriptions here. Well, that's very optimistic, but in the, later, in the latter part of your book, you demonstrate how that could go all pear-shaped, because you talk about green politics and populism. And if you start getting people to talk democratically in the way that you want, you might actually end up with what you don't want. And that's a populist view of, of how the world should be. And with extreme right wingers taking on green politics because they think that will appeal to working class people. So in a way, you really do have a job on your hands. <laughs> well, this is why I think having the theoretical arguments is 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 so important. Um, and that, that is an aspect that hasn't been to the fore uh, with the kind of you know sort of youth climate strikes and to an extent extinction rebellion. Um, it's been very much about raising awareness of the issue rather than thinking about even the sort of the reasonably short-term things that we should do about it and I think that that does leave um, that does leave 
were in both for populists, as you say, to um, to use being anti action on climate change as a way of engaging with working class people and also for the other side for actual eco-fascism of which there have been some some examples uh, we can't just sort of say we need action on climate change and then leave it silent of what we would do we have to get into it into the theory and start sort of you know setting down a bit more specifically uh, what we would do and why otherwise we're just leaving the door wide open for it to be used by all sorts of bad actors I mean, is it your view that for progressive politics to be successful, you must definitely link green politics into system change? And if you do that, you're more likely to, you know, I was going to use the word again that you tell me off, sell. <laughs> it's not sell, <laughs> but convince in a democratic way uh, the message that you want to, to get over. Yeah, I think we absolutely have to. Um, but I, and I don't, I don't think actually that system change is is going to be an automatically unpopular idea. I think, I mean, you know, when you think about what's been going on in the world in the last few years, in the last few months, in the last few weeks, you know, I think people feel that this, you know, this system is broken; it needs to change. I think. Um, it's not that people are only looking for small incremental changes in all sorts of areas of uh, uh, political and economic life. No, I think that that's, it, it's actually a message that people are prepared to listen to. As long as we do it in a way where we're actually, take, where we're actually engaging with people and not being seen or not behaving as if we're sort of a, um, a movement that's talking down to ordinary people, I think. I do think that engaging uh, with particularly with working class communities and making this something where we're talking about just transition, how people move out of uh, uh, polluting industries and so on is really, really key here. We can't just be a bunch of middle class people lecturing everybody else about what they should do. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but, you know, one of the interesting things in the way that you explained your views and, and, and you've written them in your book is it seems to me you're looking upon Marxism and Karl Marx's work, not so much as the end state that we were talking about that may be nebulous, but is a, is a process. And, and that, you know, getting people to understand that change is about looking at what are the real reasons, be, reasons behind it, how you can tackle that, how you can work with that process is probably the most important message we can get out of Marx. We can get it out of many other philosophers as well, but Marx made that very clear. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think ultimately, um, you know, Mar Marxism often gets talked about um, by its detractors um, as if it's kind of a doctrine. You know, you get accused of being in a cult and this sort of thing that, oh, you have to believe these things. And it's really not at all. I mean, Marxism is a method. It's a method of understand, a way of understanding the world. And if you understand it like that, then you can apply Marxism to issues that, that didn't exist in his time and he didn't know about. I and mean, after all, he's, uh, although, as I said, he was very concerned about the damage to the environment and he read a lot about it and he would have written more about it if he, if he had been able to. Um, but, you know, he didn't know actually about climate change because that wasn't generally known when Marx, when, when Marx lived. But you can use Marx's methods to really understand um, what's going, what, how capitalism is causing, is causing climate change now because the method is right. Well, we, we're still talking about Plato and Aristotle <laughs> and Thomas Hobbes is coming back into fashion again. So Marx mm -hmm. certainly is someone we should talk about. By the way, I'm mean, getting very close to the end, but this is not the first book you've written, is it? That's right. Um, I wrote a book called um, Diet of Austerity, Class, Food and Climate Change, which came out in 2015. Um, and that was uh, specifically about um, the... Uh, uh, the argument that the main thing that people should do to deal with uh, um, climate change is change their diets. And I was arguing, uh, you'll, you'll be shocked and surprised to learn um, for a more systemic understanding of uh, um, how food interacts with, with climate change. Well, we could do another webinar on that and get someone who believes that if you become a vegan, the world will be saved. And, you know, that would be fun as well. <laughs> okay, so if people wanted to get your book or contact you or you know, find out things in any other way. How would they go about doing that? Well, um, they can contact me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter. Um, I, I have a personal website, which is um, redpuffin.co.uk. So if you want to get in touch with me personally, you can go there. Um, the book is available on the Counterfire website, which is counterfire.org. Um, and it is also on Amazon. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, I'm sorry about that, but it is on Amazon. Um, but it's not on the Amazon Prime thing, so they don't make lots of money out of it. So yeah, well, I, was, I was waiting to see if you would blush and 
bit when you said <laughs> Addison. And you managed to get through it without blushing too much. <laughs> it was really good. Everyone's as happy. You know, I guess they had to go on Amazon. Okay, well, thanks. You know, that, that was great. And you, you did give a really good explanation of your views. And I think, you know, you put pay to people who believe that, that, that Marxists are people who believe in extreme things, but they actually believe in looking at the process, trying to understand what's happening, and that Marx is a tool for doing that. And whether you agree with him or not, I think people can see the value in that, and that's very important. So, you know, thanks for doing it, and it's been really thank, thank interesting. Well, it's been very interesting, you know, doing it. So we'll, uh, we'll end this interview now.